Hello my friends, John LaRuffy here with another Straight Up Solo, and in this episode we're going to be taking a look at uh, Takanu, okay? Now this is a really, really, really interesting solo game. I'm going to show you actually how the last couple of rounds uh, finish up, and uh, that way you'll see the game in action, you'll see the solo, and then I'll tell you about what I like about it and other things that I don't. All right, so let's get started. All right, so I'm going to uh, assume that you know how to play this game, at least you know the rules for the multiplayer, and I'll give you a little synopsis of what I'm doing for the solo, but I want people to see the solo in action first, try to explain it, so I'm not going to try to explain the whole solo game. But the way the mechanic works, and I did, by the way, some of these are um, player aids that I made myself or that I printed out from other Board Game Geek folks. Um, and the way that the solo works is with this little pyramid here. That is going to help you decide which action the, uh, the solo bot, um, the Takanu bot, is going to take. Okay, so this is a pretty elegant system. Uh, and I'm playing the solo against um, the uh, hard mode. So the hard mode basically has him build additional statues, additional buildings, and additional pillars to begin the game so that he has uh, a decent advantage over you before we start. So um, the basic mechanics of this game are you're gonna be choosing or drafting a dice from this area over here, this obelisk area, and when you do that, the dice is gonna come in two flavors. It's either gonna be pure, it comes from a pure column, which you can see I don't even have any pure dice out right now, um, or it's going to be tainted, all right? And I just finished this mat phase that uh, takes place the third out of four mat phases in the game. So the first thing I have to do before I can start again is I need to draw from the bag two dice. So I'm kind of like in the middle of a rotation, finishing up the, this rotation. I draw two dice and I'm going to roll these dice and put them in my shadow area. And I'll show you how that works in just a second. Okay. So they go in the shadow areas over here and over here. That's like the shade area, I guess. It's not really a shadow, it's like the shade. Um, and then I've got to look and make sure that all the dice are in their proper spots, okay? So in this case, two whites, they show that the whites go in the shaded area. So these are gonna be tainted dice here. Um, I'm out here in this spot, so this is okay and that's okay because um, the as you peek around the corner here, you can see that that, uh, that die actually this die is fine this has to go to the brown one has to go to the um the off limits dice um spades the forbidden dice pardon me and then over here um those two are fine and then we have these two in the shadows and both of these are going to go into the tainted space per you really can't see it per this right here um and then finally over here we take a look i'm getting a lot of shadows on this video regrettably um, and then this one is forbidden because it's still there plus this one is in the shadow area you really can't see it but there's a brown there and then finally these two this actually comes out to be a pure dice in the dark and there that is in the shadow so that's how that works and that's going to determine whether you're going to be able to place the die once you choose it on the left side or the right side and having balance is going to be important too so I'll kind of show you about that all right so we have finished up that phase. So the thing that I left in this game, there's going to be basically four more rotations. Two more rotations and then a mat phase and then two more rotations and then a mat and scoring phase. And that's going to end the game. All right. So let's go ahead and uh, start with the uh, first turn. Okay. So um, the uh, bot is going to take the first turn in this rotation here because he is number one on the uh, mat track. And I don't know if that's how you say it. M-A-A-T. That's how I said it. Matt. Sorry if I'm uh, giving anybody problems here. So what the bot's going to do is they're going to put this little thing on the first. Uh, this uh, looks like one of those, um, not cicadas, oh, for pity's sake, I'm going to forget. That uh, drives me nuts. Anyway, this little token that's a bug that I can't remember, he's going to put it right here, and he's going to take the highest black dice that's available, okay? The highest black dice that's available is this four dice right here. So he's going to take this, 
Lotus, Lotus, that's right, that's a Lotus. Okay, he's gonna take this, and it doesn't matter if it's pure or tainted for him, it's a four, and it is going to come from this action. So the bot, when he does that, is going to simply um, take cards according to the normal die roll, take from the furthest to the right, take a decree, then technology, then blessings. So his um, guy is so happy that he gets to take over here. So he's gonna take um, two cards, as it says on the board here, and he's gonna take first the two decrees, okay? Those are gonna score on the most points at the end, and then immediately we're going to replenish these. All right, and that's what he's going to do on his turn. All right, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this die over here because I need to make some papyrus. Normally I'd make two, but because I have this technology here, it says when you perform a god action, oh wait, shoot, that's not gonna work. That's for God action. So I'm going to get two Papyrus with that action. Um, and so there it goes. It was from the shaded area. So I put it over here. It's tainted. And I'm going to grab two Papyrus and add that to my spot right here. So that's one and two. Now, because he had a uh, previously built statue there, we're going to see what the bonus is for this location. This location is in the four. And so unfortunately... The, he does not obey these. I shouldn't say unfortunately, but it's not that simple. In this case, we know he gets a point from um, reading the rules, so he's going to get a point for that as his um, god a or uh, statue action because he built a statue there. And that is my turn. Now, what's going to happen on the bot's turn is from the first place, he always goes here. He's going to flip this coin, okay? And this is going to be fun with the camera. Yeah, that was great. Very elegant. Um, and then uh, it's going to say, okay, climb the stairs up. So we're going to climb the stairs and go to this Osiris God action. All right. So the Osiris action for him is to pick the highest number die. And if, it's, um, if there is a tie, it's random. So I just grab whichever one I see first. That was a three. So he's going to build a house on the three spot over there. And when he does that, he's going to look for a space where there is the fewest number of houses first. So he's going to go ahead and build right here. Okay. <clears throat> and when he does that, um, he is going to be able to have, actually, is that true? Fewest number of spaces. Uh, no, the value that, it, yes. Color determines the column. Sorry. So it's since it was a white die, he builds in the white column. If it was a gray die, it would be the place where there would be the fewest number of houses. So he builds there. Um, nothing happens. He never gets uh, goods. He never. He doesn't have a board. He doesn't have to do anything like that. So basically, he puts his guy down, and that's it. Now, he also has a statue there. So we look to see what his statue reward is. And because it's the five, he gets a scribe token over here. All right. And then he also will get an extra point. And that's, what's he, that's what he's going to do on his turn. All right? So as you may have noticed, there is no pure dies right now, which is going to make my life difficult balancing out because everything's going to be tainted. And when things are tainted, and if you're tainted to the, the bad side, to the dark side over here, you're going to lose points at the mat uh, phase spot. We do not want that. So one thing I can do is I can take a technology that will allow me to break that rule a little bit. This technology says you may treat forbidden dice as if they were pure or tainted. And that might come into play since right now there's nothing in the pure spot. So I'm going to choose this number five over here. And I put this into the shaded tainted spot. And a five says I spend three papyrus to take three cards. Okay. Well, I have two papyrus like I just got. And I have to spend one gold, which is a wild in this game. I'll spend those. Then I can get three cards. And I can get them from any section I have happiness to. So I can get them the green section or the red or this side. But you have to take them from the same lot. So if I take three cards, they have to be all from one color coding. Since this was a red spot, I'm going to have to take it from this spot if I want to make this work. So I'm going to take that one. I'm going to take this one. And then let's see. When taking a die, spend one scribe to also take an adjacent god action. That's going to be pretty good. I need to get some bonus things, so I'm going to take that. So that was two technology tiles, which will be there for the rest of the game. And then this is a once-and-done um, blessing tile that I can use and then discard it. So that actually worked out okay. So that's my turn. Now notice, I have two dice and he has two dice. When both of us has to have two dice, equal number of players have two dice, sorry. We are going to go ahead and rotate this. See the arrows pointing there? We're going to rotate it one spot so the arrow is going to point 
there, okay? So that's a rotation. When the rotation happens, um, the only other thing we're going to do is we're going to fish in the bag for one die per player, which in this case is two, and we're gonna roll those for the shaded spots. All right, so that's gonna go in the shaded spot over here, and then we're gonna do the same. Let's see if we can do this. Roll for those. Okay, now because I rotated this column, I have to look to see what changed, all right? And since this changed right here, this white is now forbidden. That's always, the gray is always tainted no matter what. Um, this one comes in here as tainted. This comes in and moves to pure, and this one goes to tainted. That stays the way it is with the gray. The white goes up. This goes to the um, forbidden dye, and then this becomes tainted and this comes pure. And also this follows suit. So even though for a while there I was in a little bit of a bind, now as the turn goes around, you can see I have more options. So maybe I didn't need that te technology card, but it's nice to have that flexibility. Okay, so then it comes back to him. He's gonna go ahead and take his next action. He's gonna flip this. So let's try to flip this again and not make a mess of it. Okay, there it goes. And it says climb up. So here we go. We're gonna find the highest number of brown dice. So the highest number of brown dice in this case is a five. He's gonna take this action. He doesn't pay papyrus. He basically increases his happiness um, by the number on the die. So that would be five. All right, so one, two, three, four, and five. Now, if he would ever increase his happiness over his population, he starts adding population um, to that as well. So that's his turn. And it kind of, kind of rotates, population, then happiness, population, then happiness. Okay, and, um, <clears throat> excuse me, he doesn't get any scribes in here because there were no scribes, but he would get a scribe token if he had uh, done those. Okay, so that's his action. Now let's go ahead and see what I'm going to do. All right, I'm gonna do one of the more complicated actions here. I'm actually going to take this number one and I'm going to use my technology down here that allows me to move it up or down by two. You can't wrap around. So I'm gonna make it a three. It's a three pure. Three pure corresponds to this spot right here. Taking this tile immediately gives me two points. So I'm gonna go from here, two points in, all right? Then I have to pay the resources shown in the top here, which is two white and a black. I have the black, but I don't have any white, so I have to pay two gold. Then I can place this anywhere on these spots over here. Okay, so in this case, it's green and, ye and um, yellow. I want to put it on this spot right here so I can get one point per side that matches. So I'm going to get, um, actually, I'm going to get one point. And then the, reg the original rules say if you match up a side, you get that point again. Whoops. So in this configuration, I actually get one, two, three, four points for putting that down. One, two, three, four. I put one of my, my pillars on it, okay? Then, because I have this special technology here, it says when you raise a pillar, always activate the ability of the pillar tile. Normally, I'd have to have a pure tile, or I'm sorry, a sunny side tile for that to activate, but it's not. It's a dark tile, but because of that technology, I can still get the bonus. The bonus in this case says one scribe action. So I'm gonna go ahead and get a scribe. That will help me take an Osiris turn. Um, that's coming up here pretty soon. Or an Osiris action, pardon me. And that is actually a really, not Osiris, sorry. It's a, um, oh geez, what's it called? Um, an Anubis action. Sorry, I'm not up to my Egyptian gods. Um, so anyway, the, uh, the reality is I did that, got a bunch of points off of that, and that is my turn now. And then just checking, just so you can see, if I'd had a building in that spot, I would have also gotten more points. Any building. It's actually not just me. It's anybody's. There were no buildings in that spot. And um, I got those that bonus. And also, if I covered something else up, like one of these, I would have gotten all of those. But because I covered up the bonus score, that's how that worked. And then finally... Um, you know, you get the points for wherever that was. So I'm going to add another one over here. Actually, I'm going to push this down. 
and then add another one right there. And that's my turn. He had a statue on there, so his statue corresponds to the top spot, which is a scribe. As you can clearly see, there are a lot of little rules to this game that you have to remember. And uh, there, that can be a little cumbersome, hence the massive amount of player aids, because you're going to be in the rule book for a while uh, learning this game. There's just no doubt about it. It's very hard to remember everything. And one of my beefs with the game, and by the way, I love a lot about this game, but the iconography, while it's there, it's just a little bit too cryptic to be obvious. And maybe I'm just slow, and I'm not talking about everything, but I'm talking specifically about some of this stuff. It just, it's like, okay, you know, on this scoring spot, whose pillar? Okay, I guess it's my pillar times these buildings, but they got to be mine. It's, it's just a little bit obtuse, and I wish it was a little clearer. I don't know how I would make it clearer, but... That's, it, it takes a little bit to get used to. All right, so there was my turn. Okay, now he's going to flip this again. We're going to see what ends up happening here. Oh, nice. Dropped it on the old floor. On the floor, you'll just have to take my word for it that it was another, it was actually this one, which means slide over. So I slide over, and I put it on that guy. That guy is this spot right here. There are no... Um, dice here. So when that happens, he moves over here and takes the uh, next action. And I want to be doubly sure, I believe, that it's clockwise. Let me pause the video and just be 100% sure on that. And I was wrong. Counterclockwise. So he'd move over here. Now see these two are fives. If there's a tie of fives, he's always going to take the pure one. Okay? So if, or if let's say this was forbidden, there was nothing there but forbidden die, he'd still have to move counterclockwise. So he's going to take the purest die of the highest number, which is this, okay? And that, again, corresponds to a population move of five. Sorry, happiness move of five. So here's we got a situation where he's already maxed out. So we're going to count it like this. One, two, three, four. And the man can't get any happier. So that's all there is to it for him. He is maxed out on his happiness track. That's the first time I've seen that happen in a couple of games. So it's just the way it goes. With him so he has taken his fourth die now i need to take my fourth die all right so what i've decided to do and first of all i gotta take i think i may have spun this one too many times accidentally so to make this work i'm going to move the scoring marker right there because we should still have um two more rotations before uh we end up scoring this that was just my fault um but anyway so yeah one two right or I had these things backwards. I don't know. See, that's the one thing with this game. And it's it was just an error on a lot going on where I made a mistake. I do know that we're about to do a mat phase. So I'll, I know that we still have one, two, three, four. So it's going to turn here for the next one. We're going to have a mat phase here. And we're going to score. So I'll put that over there just to uh, remind myself. I think I just had those tokens backwards at the beginning of the game when I set it up. Um, so anyway... One, two. No, I didn't. So I'm going to rotate. Yeah, no, that's right. Okay. Anyway, um, I'm going to do this. I'm going to take this spot right here. This is a brown. I'm going to use it to harvest, okay? When you harvest, you don't have to pay the guy his bonus for the action. I'm going to harvest four bread. I am limited <clears throat> to only being able to get two bread out of that four because my production is only at two. You get more of those when you, up, uh, when you put buildings on here and increase your production limit. So what happens is... I get two bread, all right? But the two bread that I couldn't build, I actually have to put over in my tainted place because I'm too greedy. So those are gonna count against my balance, all right? So now I have a balance <clears throat> which is seven to nine. Okay, so let me show you what happens. But before that, I've decided I'm, all, I'm going to perform one of those Anubis actions where I'm going to spend two scribes to take any die from anywhere, even a forbidden die, and perform any action from anywhere I want. The one thing you can't do is you can't tweak the value unless you spend yet another one of those scribes. So what I'm going to do in this case is I want to build another building over here. It's going to cost me two bread. So I'm going to take a two and I'm going to take it in this case um, the Anubis action will not count on either of these, so it doesn't matter. And I can take it from the Forbidden area, which I will. I'm just going to take this two, put it down here, okay? And it's going to allow me to put one of these houses on this spot right there. It costs me two bread 
because the spot said two bread. When I do that, I can move my population up to, okay, actually, take that back. I don't want to take the two. I want to take the highest number I possibly can because the bread cost is independent. So actually, I want to take this five. I want to make this a six. So I'm going to take this one off here, make it a um, six. The reason I can do that is because I'm playing a God action, okay? So that's why I'm uh, legitimately allowed to do that. So that's six. And then I can move my population, population excuse me, up to 19, which is good. Now these bonuses are for happiness, not population. So I don't get anything like that. But that does help me get my population up so I can set myself up for some bigger um, happiness bonuses later. Okay, so as you can see, he's got four dice. I've got four dice. So we do a rotation. Now, because we both have four dice and not two, we go to a mat phase. So the way the mat phase works is first we have to balance. He, being the la this is the fourth mat phase we have, he automatically will set his to plus one. Okay? Mine is set um, because I had seven and seven, but two more is nine. So I'm two in the minus. So I have to go to minus two. And that puts me here. The person who's closest to zero will go first. That's him. He will also get a bonus of a couple points. Well, that's actually after you finish it. Okay. So, <clears throat> um, of course, you hear my cat in the, uh, in the distance meowing. That's what cats do. Sorry about that. Okay, so then we've got that set up. We finished the mat phase. Neither I didn't lose any points. He never loses points for that. We're going to go ahead and take a look at these cards right here. Because he is the winner of that phase, he's going to randomly choose one of these cards first. Okay. Because that just happened, I will choose whatever one didn't fall. Okay, so he gets this one. That means that he, this power, he always gets a four on that if he ties. You'll have to read the rules about how that works. That's in case we, we both tie in this phase. Whoever's got the highest number here would win. So he dropped, or I dropped it, um, the uh, gold one. I'm going to get the gold, although I could choose to get either of these, okay? But I actually want that gold for a variety of reasons. So I'm going to go ahead and get that gold. All right. So the mat phase is now done. Now we have to finish up the rotation. So I put these dice, all of them, back in the bag with one hand. No, I'm not gonna do one hand, sorry. Give them a shake. And roll on the shaded region. So we've got those two. And we've got these two. Okay, so then we, since I've already rotated it, we got to rebalance everything. So this is still legitimate. This is now in the shaded spot. This goes into the uh, pure spot. This goes into the shaded spot or tainted spot. There we go. Then over here, that gray stays. The black and gray, um, this one actually goes now into the, whoops, the pure area. That stays over there. These two, since it's shaded, will be here and here. And this one is still there. Okay, so we're ready to go. So now we have basically um, one more time through where we're going to have two more rotations. So there and there. And that's, see, that's why I just goofed this up. I'm sorry, folks. This should be right here. Okay. <clears throat> so that was the mat and rotation phase. Now we're ready to start again and have basically um, one more play. Uh, where we're going to get four more dice and then the game is going to be over and then I'll show you how it scores. One thing I forgot to do was during the mat phase, his little pyramid gets shuffled and built again. So I'm going to basically just shuffle these up and build it again. And I'm sure you're not going to need to see me do it. So you'll take my word for it. Now, to be sure this game does, this video doesn't drag on too long, you've seen all the actions demonstrated except for this one right here. So I'm just gonna talk to you about this real quick. When you take this action, um, if you take it for, the, the purity of the die does not matter, but what it'll do is the number of the die will let you determine where you're gonna build a statue. You can build a statue for the people regardless of the number, and that would be over here. These have already been taken by me. 
or you can build a statue in the temple area. These have not been taken. Well, this one hasn't been. And if you do that, you get three points for each pillar that's yours that is in that column. So if he did it, he would get three because of that. If I did it, I would get nothing, okay? Then for the rest of the, or, or if you decide to build, to take, let's say this three, you can build a statue in this area. When you do that, you put it in that area that matches that spot. He already has one, so he couldn't do that. But the four, if the four is empty, you could build a statue matching that spot, and it is not empty. That is that spot right there. So the dice value determines whether you can build statues for the gods. If you build statues for the gods, the, um, the solo player will either get a point, a scribe, or both. You, when, when he or you take his action in those spots, the god action, and you will get one of these bonuses depending on where you take the action. To pay for this, the um, solo bot doesn't pay anything. You must pay this, the amount of granite under these areas. And that'll also help you at the end of the game. Um, I, the only other thing too that I didn't show you on here was that faith tokens, faith tokens you can get in a couple different ways, but over here you can get them. You can play the faith tokens to help balance the scales on one side or the other. They automatically go away at the end of the round, but each faith token is worth one, so it can help balance out the scales, okay? So that is uh, one of the things that can be helpful in regards to doing what you um, want to do here. Um, so anyway, that is uh, the other action. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna play through the rest of the game off camera and then get to the scoring and show you how it's all gonna score at the end. Okay, so we have gotten to the end. We've played the last couple of turns. Um, I've got four dice, he's got four dice. So we would go to a rotation, which I just did. The rotation then goes to a mat phase because we have four dice on our boards. So I have eight versus seven, which is a plus one. He always gets a plus one in rounds three and four, regardless of what his dice are. Now there's a tie. The AI will always use a four value here, even though it's a zero. So he breaks the tie. So he goes in the first spot. I go in the second spot. So that's gonna give him a scoring advantage at the end. All right, now because it's a scoring round, this is the, the second scoring round. There's two scoring rounds in this game. The first one happened before off camera. Here's the second one. We're gonna go ahead and score around the board. This area is scored by whoever has the most um, in each column will get three points. These guys also count for one of them in both columns, those uh, t the um, statues. And if there is a tie like there is here, the place, the person who has the highest one takes precedent. So I get three points for this and three points for this because I took precedent here. Okay, so that's six for me. He has two to my one, so he gets three and I have two to his two. And so, but because I have the higher ones, then I get precedent. So I get nine points, he gets three. So he's gonna get his three points here, one, two, three. And then I'm gonna go ahead and get my nine points here, which will be up to 43. Next scoring spot, as we work our way around, and by the way, so I was looking for something that looked like this, or, and see how you can see there's two hourglass, the silver and the gold, that says silver scoring, or gold, score, you know, both of those are scoring. So we go around here to the next spot. We score the temple area. So in this case, we're first going to get one point per, per building or um, statue that is ours, okay? So he has one, two, three, four. So he gets four. I have two. So I get two. Then we score pillars. The pillar is worth... The, the amount of statues and buildings that are in the row that are owned by you. So this pillar for him is worth one, two. So that's two points. This pillar is worth one, two, three, four, right there. And those are worth nothing. So this is, I'm sorry, not nothing. Those are worth two. So we've got two, four is six, two more, eight, two more is 10. All right, so he gets 10 points on that. Pillar scoring up to 81. 
I have this pillar worth one, this pillar worth one, and this pillar worth one is three. Not so good. One, two, three. Then we see whoever's in the first spot of this track will get three points. That's him. One, two, three. The second spot only scores if it's a three or more game, which doesn't happen in this case. And then we score for happiness. Three times the number of triangles. Well, he is a happy camper. He gets 15. So he's over here. He's going to go to 99. I am not so happy, and neither would you be with this kind of score. I only get three points. One, two, three. Then we score for the um, number of statues we've placed. Well, I've placed two statues for three. Again, pretty sorry. One, two, three. He has built all of his statues. So that means he gets 21. You can see what's happening here, folks. He's turning my butt into buttermilk. All right, so anyway, the uh, 20, so now he's got me 120 to uh, 54. As you can see, the difficulty on the difficult bot can be pretty challenging. Then we score for the, um, if I had built enough buildings, I would score up here. I did not. <clears throat> I'd also score two points if I had maxed out any of my production allowances. I did not. But I do have to pay two bread, which I have. For each bread that I couldn't, um, then I would be uh, penalized three points. Then we go to the final endgame scoring. For him, he gets two points for each technology card that he has. That's two, four. And he gets four points for each of these in, this, in the difficulty that I'm playing with. So that would be four, eight, 12, 16. So he gets 16 more points. Boy, am I glad I filmed this one, huh? So 16 more points, 36. And then, because that's not enough, he gets two or one point for every two of these. So he has one, two, three, four. Four more points. One, two, three, four. We round that down. He has 140 points. I am not going to do that well, but I do have my bonus cards. Now, the thing with the bonus cards, you're only allowed to score three of them, and none of the icons on this side can be the same. So I have three unique icon bonus cards, so that's good. So this is three times the number of technology cards I have. Well, I have one, two, three, four, five, so that's 15. So that's going to put me at 69 points. Then... Five points per statue built for the people. I have two of those, so that's ten more. Then, two points for every gold bar, one point for every other resource that I have. So that's two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So I didn't actually do that bad in those scorings, but I did abysmally um, throughout the rest of the game. So, there you have it. That is the score, and I believe that's all we score for him, too. Yep, we got his stuff. Good. All right, so that's the gameplay. Now I'll tell you about what I think about this game as a solo option. All right, so that was Teikanu. You saw the playthrough, the solo. A couple things I'll say. Number one, I've never played this um, without being a solo player. I played it four times. That was the end of my fourth game. Yeah, I probably could have used a couple more games under my belt before I play this as you saw me struggle with some nitnoid things. But at the same time, the reason I wanted to get the video out is because I really, really enjoy this game as a solo play. Um, the things that I love about it, the choices are a lot of fun. There is a lot of variety, even though the game, the game state, um, it's not, the cards, they vary throughout the game. Um, but the strategy is, it's 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 something it's like a sand it feels like a little bit more of a sandbox which i like i love sandboxy games this one kind of feels like that a little bit the dice push you in different ways actions that work that don't work that's fun that's a fun mechanic um it's very fiddly and that's one of the negatives about it although i mean it's going to be fiddly with the way it works and that's i'd say i'd say one of my bigger downsides of the game is this game is um, incredibly fiddly with regards to, I roll this dice, I move this dice, I move these here, I move that there, I got to adjust this, I got to adjust that. And sometimes, you know, um, they did a good job trying to explain it in the rules. You know, two twists, then this phase, then this phase, then this phase. But it's still very fiddly with regards to what to do out there. Um, in my opinion, okay, your mileage may vary. 
Um, the other thing that I love about the game is that, um, oh, let me just, let me say my negatives first because I should, um, because there's more that I love about it than I, than I don't. The obelisk is cool. It makes it easy to turn. I find it a kind of a pain in the neck to stare around that thing. I know that's silly, but I'm all, you even could tell while I was trying to figure out, you know, bobbing and weaving like a boxing match here, trying to figure out which dice are where, what's going on there. It's a good concept. I love it, but it's a pain in the neck to see around it. And so that's a detractor. It's just one more distraction in a game that needs no distraction because there's a lot to take in. Yes, I get it that it's it's thematic. Um, and maybe I could just remove it, you know, and just not play with it. But it, it does keep that center disc in place. And so that's important. Um, and it doesn't, you know, move around. But it's still, it's like I can't quite see the dice in the side. I can't quite see which... You know, is it shady or whatever? And then the action tiles that are probably the, the ones you have to pay most attention to with regards to building the pillars. What's going on there? I can't quite see it. So that's kind of, that's an annoyance um, and something that I think detracts from the experience. I know why they did it. Thematically, it makes sense. And it's cool because it's an idea of like casting a shadow. But in actuality, I find it to be kind of a headache. Okay, that's the only downside I have to say about the actual playing of the game. The other thing that's tough about this game is that the rules and all the little things, the actions, that I do this, then this, 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 and it happens. I do this, and then I have to score this, this, and this. It's cool because there's a lot of variety in what's going on. It's difficult in execution. It's hard to remember the nitnoids of what, how do I score this? How do I do that? What costs me this? You know, like, oh, I have to lose. Uh, and, and it's on the board in, in, the, in most cases, which is good. Except it's not on the board at all for the solo player. So that's why I had, I mean, and I, I never make my own because I'm kind of lazy sometimes, but I had to make my own uh, player sheet because I was sick and tired of flipping back and forth in the, in the manual to try to figure out what the um, Automa was going to do based on their action. I, it's easy to figure out what action they're going to take. The pyramid is slick. I love that. It's very simple to see, okay, he's going to do this. No problem. And that's great because that gives you, you don't actually know exactly what's going to come up. You can kind of see, okay, it could go this way or this way. It's going to be one or the other. But then in the execution is where it becomes a little bit of a task. And so this game is going to reward future plays because as, or, for, you know, play after play, because as you keep playing it, the game is going to go faster. I found that even after four plays, I can play a, a, a two-man game or a, you know, a solo game, so to speak, with the, the bot in just over an hour, not including setup, which is pretty good for a game like this. Um, you know, and I'm not really one for that's uh, an AP player. I don't get stuck on a lot of decisions. I mean, I make the best ones, which is you can see in the score here, but I usually kind of move things around. So I'm a fairly fast player, um, but the, the using the solo bot, once you get an idea of what he does and how he does it, this game really hustles, which I love. So this is one that I can set up and, and bang out a game um, quickly and have just a, a delicious decision tree, deli uh, decision space, pardon me, um, from a solo game. It's very competitive on, on hard. On easy, I won the first game. On medium, I won my second game. Maybe I got lucky. Maybe he just didn't get so lucky. Then I bumped it up to hard, and then I find that that is where the, uh, obviously, you can see the, the scoring. I've, I've scored, the highest I've scored yet in this game after four plays is a 92. I got an 89 in that one. I'm sure that that's leaving points on the table. I'm sure I'm not the best. Uh, but he blew it away there with a 140. The game he played beforehand on hard was like a 111 or something like that. So um, when he was on easy and medium, he was score he scored, I think, an 80 and maybe like an 84. So they were closer, but I still beat him. So I like the idea of the challenge and the difficulty there. And I can add even one more thing where I could make his decree cards worth eight points at the end instead of four if I really wanted to... Uh, to ratchet up the challenge. And sometimes he gets them, sometimes he doesn't. So that's kind of hit or miss. I'll probably leave that out because there's plenty of challenges, um, you know, just by the way it is. So why would you like this game? You like this game if you like the variety of decisions, if you like the variety of actions, the multiple ways to score points and the variety of strategies. There's a lot to, uh, to, to do here. There's a little bit of angst with that uh, purity and uh, tainted track. The first two games I played, that I had no problem balancing out. This game and the kind before, when those purity dice go away, it becomes really difficult. You're, you're stuck with a lot of tainted dice, and then it's going to be penalizing. So you have to kind of think, mm, geez, is it worth? Maybe I just bite the bullet and take the three minus points and go, you know, second. 
um, for what I'm doing, but I better make sure that it's worth it. Uh, I love the technology and the blessing cards and the decree cards. That's probably one of my favorite parts of the game because I love the fact that it can tweak those little rules for you and make an exciting experience each time you play, which is totally different based on the bonuses you get. And the technology cards and the decree cards really drive to different kinds of strategies, which are awesome. The blessing cards are circumstantial, um, but that's okay. Some of them are quite good, and I've definitely taken those um, you know, and used them before to my advantage. So... Bottom line, components are great. The AI is great as far as the decisions. The game is a little clunky until you really learn all the nitnoid things about it. So plan on getting this if you like this kind of thing. But after you pour through the rules a couple times, you're going to be in that rule book, you know, looking it back up again until you really get the hang of it. Or you, you know, print out some, some player aids like I did from Board Game Geek that'll definitely help. I kind of recommend that. The only thing they give you are these uh, double-sided ones which show the dice. It shows where the dice go, and you can use this from a purity standpoint, but I still found this is still hard. You're looking back and forth and back and forth and this and that. Um, so that was kind of a, a challenge. Then they also talk about the pillars, and then in the back they show the turn order and briefly kind of what the god actions do. And that's fine. That's definitely helpful, and it'll jog your memory. It's the little things that kind of that takes some getting used to. So... Again, uh, if you haven't already, like and subscribe to my channel, please. John LaRufa, this has been a straight-up solo for Takanu. It's been great. I love this game, and I hope that you like it too. Have a good one, everybody, and happy gaming.